Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. We're back broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio here at the uh, KU Hospital. Today's a really special program. I think I say that about all of our programs, but this one is special because, first of all, we've got a great team of people here with us today, and I think you're going to really enjoy hearing about them, hearing from them, and, and about them, I hope. Um, you know, we have spoken on many different occasions about youth sports. And we have tried to take a pretty fine line and just be honest as we could about the information and the data that was out there. One of the things we've learned about this pandemic, you've heard us say it before, you build an airplane while you fly it, good luck. And today is no different than that basic theme. As new information arises, we feel that we have to offer you our healthcare and medical insights about that information. We're not going to take on a lot of policy stuff. You know, we've tried to not do that. We try to stick to our lane and tell you this is the best we know as far as medical science can deliver. And today we're going to talk to you about the medical science of COVID and sports and recovery because there's information that is changing. To help us address that, of course, is my right-hand man, Doc Hawk, here on the stage, of course, with us every day, Bruce Toby. Bruce Toby is the... I say to people, he's the father of sports medicine here at the University of Kansas Health System. Some days I call him the godfather of sports medicine here, too, just with the best with him a little bit. Bruce is an outstanding orthopedic surgeon. He's the chair of orthopedic surgery. I think of him as a good friend, and, and he and I have been both here at KU for approximately a very long time. And yeah, I think it may have been a couple. After pandemic, it will be five or six. Michael Rippey. Michael Rippey is a sports medicine uh, concussion physician here at KU, and he does an outstanding job. And some of the information that's emerging is neurocognitive function. And so we want to take that on. And then to my left is Tim Beaver. Tim is a sports medicine cardiologist. So he's a heart doc who specializes in taking care of athletes and the complications that sports can bring to athletes. So we've asked Tim to be here because he is the head of our sports medicine cardiology program, has done a great job working with us, not only with our professional teams, but also our college teams and our youth teams. So we need to answer these new and talk about this new information. But first, Doc Hawk, yeah, hi. let's talk about our numbers because there is some good news here. Yeah, we are um, very happy the last two days we have been. Um, after again reaching that peak of 39 recently, we are down to 24 patients in the hospital nine of those in the ICU and six of those on the ventilator. So that is good. We have had um, discharges. Um, you know, we have had admissions as well during that time, but overall, the numbers are much lower than they were pretty recently. So that's a very good thing. We do like that. Yes. Bruce Toby, again, you started the sports medicine program here at KU. You've seen it through some early years and to the place where now we're the team physicians for the Chiefs and Royals and a number of school districts. And we work with Lawrence Memorial over at KU and we're the, the uh, part of the partners that are at Kansas Team Health. So lots of sports medicine. Talk to us about what you see as being so challenging in a pandemic to make sure that athletes are safe. Well, I think that, uh, you know, what we do and what we've done so well in our institution is to give the best scientific information and uh, present that. But then there's the other issue, and that is the implementation. And that's where I want to give some credit to a lot of different people, because when we start talking about testing, somebody has to implement that, somebody has to get that done. And that includes our team doctors and also the trainers that are associated with it. So it is a big team deal. I was talking to Dr. Vincent Key, who's taken care of the Royals for us as the, as the head team doctor for many years. And what's going to be difficult for us is to implement these type of studies that need to be done, all the right things, while a team is playing, actually engaging into a, a season. And so it'll be challenges. But fortunately, we have you know, great partners for the Royals, for example. We have uh, um, Nick Kenny and his people, and they work very closely with uh, Vince and uh, Joe Nolan and his colleagues to get these things done. But it is, it is extremely difficult and time consuming. It is, and you're gonna hear about what some of those things are that we're, we're talking about in just a few minutes. As we do that, Dana, talk to us a moment, just some of the extensive testing that's being done, for example, on KU athletes as they go forward. Yeah, so um, we have had a very good health partnership with the, the Lawrence campus, again, led by Chris Wilson, and then uh, Boots on the Ground there, 
Dr. Scrimshaw and Lawrence as well. So there is an extensive amount of testing going on. There has been since the athletes arrived on campus. Um, since that time now, there is um, going to be a ramping up of the testing as well. And this testing is mostly going to be PCR testing, but we are also doing antibody testing as well. Um, from there, there's, an, there's other algorithms that we're looking at if you are positive. You know, certainly isolation, quarantine, contact tracing has been very important. Further testing is going to involve things of like specific organs such as the heart that are going to be evaluated um, there in Lawrence as well. So there will be further um, evolution of this, but right now we have been testing, we have continued to test, and as we move forward, we are evaluating and actually increasing our testing as we move forward. And what we've known so far in our testing is that, yes, we've had positive tests as athletes yeah. return to campus, mm -hmm. and as the Royals return to, camp, mm -hmm. to, to, to practice, or the, or the Chiefs. But what we've seen is that once people got here, and for example, the Jayhawks got to their sports uh, program when they came back this summer, really the number of positives has been very, very small out mm -hmm. of all the athletes we've tested. So that's impressive. Um, I think the same, same thing has happened with the Royals the Chiefs. But Mike, one of our concerns is in those people who have been positive, that there are some indications of some neurocognitive, that's a big word, you'll have to help us, and what that means, some neurocognitive changes that do raise a few alarm bells. Can you address that for us? Sure. Um, and I would say, you know, we're still learning a lot about this uh, from the neurology side of things. But um, we do have some experience in, in previous epidemics, the, the, the SARS and MERS from uh, a few years ago, which were similar viruses, um, where we would see these long-term neurocognitive or um, really at, at, the, at a very basic level um, issues with things like attention, um, focus, um, and, and these mirror actually very closely um, symptoms that you might see after a concussion. And, and so um, we're still learning about that. The neurology community has really been talking a lot about this um, and, and trying to make sure we're watching very closely for these types of symptoms um, after uh, a player uh, has been tested positive. Yeah, so was one of the concerns then that can you tell a player that it's safe to return if they haven't been followed from a neurocognitive standpoint or redone testing? Um, I think the, the really short answer is we don't know if it's safe to return. Um, in, in talking with colleagues, um, there's been a really mixed response about this. Um, you know, I, I've talked with a couple of colleagues who said, we're not testing at all, but we're not doing any cognitive testing when they're recovered and they're cleared by all the other team physicians. You know, we're, we may not even be involved. Um, and I've talked to other people who have a very regimented, um, you know, we have our, our impact test or our C3 logics, whatever their computerized neurocognitive testing is, and they're doing it at very specified times that, you know, they recover and then two weeks and then three weeks and then six weeks um, and so on and so forth. And, and, and I would advocate somewhere probably closer to that end of the spectrum, uh, maybe somewhere in the middle, but that we need to be monitoring for these cognitive deficits. Um, it, it's a really simple thing to do. Uh, we, you know, in the athletic world, it's already sort of built in that we have these cognitive tests. And um, while we don't know how sensitive those cognitive tests are in this particular setting, because um, they've never been tested for, you know, post-infectious uh, cognitive disorders, um, you know, we'd like to think we would see um, some of these effects on those tests. And I think the key is to our listening audience that this is a relatively new finding. And one of the problems in a pandemic is that as you fly that plane trying to build it, you learn new things. And just as in the first days of the coronavirus, we were in this room with a lot of crowds, with, a, with an old telephone right here. We we're all huddled over it. There was a bank of reporters right here. We probably had 15 people in the room or 20 people in the room, things we would never do today. Because we've learned so much about the coronavirus, we've totally inverted it. Oh, there we are. There I go. I look so good back there 21 weeks ago. I had more hair 21 weeks ago. Look at that guy. He's got hair. He looks younger. He looks like he's been sleeping. Well, what is that? But today we know that we can't do those things. And so the story changes as we learn. So, Tim, we've been learning a little bit more about inflammation of the heart muscle, what we call myocarditis. And we know that it can occur in people. The study out of Germany looked at 100 different patients and found that 70% of them had inflammation of the heart muscle. And there appears to be emerging evidence that that can be true in athletes as well, which begs the question, how safe is it to be back in a high intensity or high impact sports 
after you've had COVID? I, I, I think that's the, that's the thing, and I'm just concerned we don't really know the answer. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know. It's sort of the million dollar question. I think to put it in context, you know, for just to give the general audience a context, I think we've known for a long time that viruses affect the heart, whether it be acutely from the infection or an inflammatory phase of the virus mm -hmm. that occurs afterwards. And so as um, sports medicine physicians and cardiologists, we've followed patients and screened them for symptoms. Um, and also have testing to confirm if they have symptoms, if they have suggestion of myocarditis. What was unique about this study is the asymptomatic population um, had significant changes which they weren't expecting. And so that's where that's hard to put into context, although the age group was older than our average athletes. I'm an adult cardiologist. I usually take care of people you know, 18 to 35 that are participating in high-level sports. So 60 years, you're saying we don't really have high-level <laughs> sports. No, I take care of master's athletes, too. But, but <laughs> I'm not right. that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That'd yeah. be Bruce Toby, right? Yeah. He runs marathons. So I think the, the context is we don't know, and I think there's emerging evidence that are coming out of some of the testing that's occurring with some of the bigger programs that people are having finding asymptomatic myocarditis. And that's really what the hullabaloo is about and, and all the concern. And, and um, that's the context in which people are concerned about the, the new studies. So the one study was an autopsy study. I don't think it was really that significant to the population. It just showed the, the virus can be in the heart. Um, the other study was important based on the fact that they found asymptomatic mm -hmm. people having post-inflammatory changes time out from the virus infection. So you know, the MRI is a unique tool as well. We don't, in the course of looking at athletes and, and diagnosing them unless they have a suggestion of myocarditis, they don't usually go to that study. And a cardiac MRI is not an uncommon study for us to order on an athlete, but not a routine study to order. So does echocardiogram find it, or does it take an MRI to do it? So it depends on the extent of the heart involved. So if the heart has significant fluid from the inflammatory process around it, or it has a significant area of damage, you can see it on ultrasound. Um, the, when you get to start getting more microscopic levels and evidence of inflammation, mm -hmm. that's something that's very specific to see on an MRI. And that's why that was used in that study as a tool, because it can pick up scar and it can pick up inflammation. So this is kind of new and evolving news, right? I mean, what are you hearing from colleagues uh, in your field around the country? You know, I think as everybody's seeing in the meeting, it, there's, there's some mixed emotions. It's been a little bit of a polarizing topic in the respect that some people, you know, I think we're dealing with a population of young people that are healthy and the majority of them are going to be safe. But the problem is, is that with the propensity of this virus to affect the heart more and emerging data showing asymptomatic people having evidence of inflammation, the concern about that baseline rate of sudden death with myocarditis being around 8%, that that could be higher because you have an asymptomatic population that's going to be active. And so that inflammatory phase or even the post-inflammatory phase when you develop a little scar could put you at higher risk. So, so lots of inflammation in the heart muscle, but we are really beginning to know how. We knew that was true acutely. We're seeing it for months and um, several, two to three months afterwards. We don't know when that inflammation begins to go away. We don't know what it means to the heart muscle, raises our concern. So as you said, you got to know what you don't know. Do you feel like it's safe to tell an athlete, that it's okay to tell an athlete that it is safe to go back? I mean, my job is when I have an athlete with a problem, I sit down with them and we go through and it's a shared decision-making discussion. You know, this is the particular problem you, you have. This is the risks. And at this point, I really can't, other than the emerging data, give them information about the risks. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel like I know that it's safe to go back necessarily right. without a lot of testing that is outside the norm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, we all have this in our respective fields. So I'm a cystic fibrosis doctor. I treat people with long, but I mean, my patients all died when I started. When Bruce and I were very young, uh, my patients only lived to be 19, and now they're living to be 40 and 50 years of age. And many of them wanted to go to college. And, you know, how do you say to a young person, okay, you're going to go to college with cystic fibrosis. Hey, that's an amazing accomplishment. But then a lot of them have role models as respirat respiratory therapists and nurses. So they come to me and they say, Doc, I want to be a respiratory therapist. And you know, I've, I've known these patients for 10 or 15 years sometimes, and, and they'll, I want to be a respiratory therapist. And I'm going to say, you know, I just can't tell you that that's safe, mm. right? I can't tell you that it's safe. And I think that's the struggle, because you don't want to put a patient who's susceptible to severe lung infections around a respiratory, be a respiratory mm. therapist, when that could be a profession 
that get you in front of a lot of people with bad lung infections. And so we don't tell you not to do it. We just have to be have an honest conversation and say, I don't know if it's safe. So Mike, if an athlete comes to you and feels a little bit in a fog or something, maybe they've had COVID, what do you think? And can you tell them that it's safe? Um, well, luckily I have this conversation a lot, um, both around return to play from concussion and, and sort of those long-term concussion effects and whether they should keep playing or not. So, um, it, you know, like Tim, it, it's a conversation that, uh, uh, that, that it isn't necessarily new. It's just sort of a different framing of it maybe. Um, and I think it's the same thing where I would say, you know, if, if you had these foggy symptoms or you're confused, even if it may not be more neurologic risk, what, what are the other risks that we have to think about? Are you at higher risk for, you know, other muscu musculoskeletal injuries or, or those types of things? Because those have been shown uh, after concussion. And so I would sit down and I, I think it's the same thing as, as with, with Tim. I would say, you know, we need to talk about this together. What are your, what are your risks? And in, in most cases right now, I would say with this, we don't know. Um, but what are some of the things we want to think about um, as potential risk and, and using other other uh, knowledge that we have about other issues sort of similar to this, you know, what, what do we think? Um, so I think, you know, I, I would personally like to see them back to their normal cognitive function before we return them to a high level athletic event. Um, but, you know, we, again, we would have to sort of share that conversation and, and, and decide sort of where things fall. You know, and Bruce, I think you've done this for, okay, I'm not trying to say you're old, but you and I have done this for a long time. Um, it feels like that is a conversation that we have with patients. Is it a risk? Is it not a risk? I mean, that's just something we have to talk to patients about, and the patient and the family have to weigh that risk to decide what they want to do. Yeah, I think it's it's in the approach, though. What you want to do is to show that, that you care about them and care about their opinion, but we as, as healthcare providers who have a better knowledge base, we need to be able to put that fairly clearly to these individuals that there are risks and the risks sometimes can be very significant. And sometimes we don't know what all the risks are, which is where I think the, the problem is right here. Well, Jill, that was an opening log because mm -hmm. of a prologue. We wanted to make sure we kind of hit the key scientific points. I wonder if there's questions out there now from our media friends. All right. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask one after that conversation. Just if I'm a parent and my child or somebody in our family had COVID a couple months ago and are getting ready to go back to school and they play a sport. So just again, what would you say to that parent about whether or not their kiddo should be playing? You know, I know, I, I think I know what I would say, but I'm going to turn to our, our sports experts. I mean, you know, my sense is, it's kind of like I told my patients who want to be respiratory therapists. I don't know if it's safe. And, and that's not saying it's not safe. It's saying I can't tell you that it is because some of this stuff occurs fairly late in the disease, Tim. Yeah, and I, I think there's a lot of unknown. And so we don't know if it's safe. And that's part of the reason where everybody's having all these conversations. And I think, you know, it, it's tough. We The data we have mostly that's published is in an older age group. So I am also don't take care of pediatric patients, but I think it's important as we have this is that I think that's what some of this the the people that have decided to postpone their seasons realize is that having the tincture of time to have more information about these athletes may benefit uh, benefit them all. In fact, isn't that why the Big Ten stopped fall football because they didn't feel like they knew enough and they'd had some myocarditis in some of their athletes? That's my understanding. Yeah, um, we, that's what's what big. That's that's ESPN's reporting. Right, right. <laughs> that's my source yeah. of all medical fact. ESPN. Michael, what do you? How do you feel about that? As far as the neurocognitive effects, what 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 would you say if a if a parent asked you, is this a, is this safe? Uh, well, I think I would echo. I, I don't know if it's safe, um, and I think what I would talk to them about is if you're going to go back to to play, if you make that decision after we have this conversation, that we have a good plan in place to monitor that, whether it's formalized. Um, you know, computerized cognitive testing or, um, you know, but making sure that not only the parents are involved in that, that if they have an athletic trainer or the coaches, um, the staff at school, the school nurse, um, but making sure there's a lot of people watching them um, in this situation and, and monitoring for these, these issues. And if they come up, that they can react quickly to them. I think that's an important piece to this. Bruce, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Again, you and I have been here for a long time and I, I, I'm a little mm -hmm. nervous. I, I, I don't feel comfortable saying it's safe. What, how about you? Yeah, here's a, if my son and daughter was asking about participation, 
uh, and have not, not been ill. It would depend on what they're doing and maybe what their goals are and where they're playing. But if they have had COVID, I would tell them not to resume playing for an extended period of time. I would think almost it would be the end of the se- It would be an, uh, another season before I would encourage them, or if I had the power to tell them not to do it, uh, I would tell them not to do it until uh, at least several months. I, I just think that there are risks that are unknown at this point. And life is precious and health is precious. And, you know, life doesn't end when you finish your high school career or your college career. It goes on. And some people want to participate in sports in their 50s and even in their 60s. Or so. And so it's important to keep your health. And if, if we're not just talking about um, college sports it, let's, or high school, let, let's even hit people our age. If we've had COVID, I, I think we'd even have to say you have to be very careful going back to exercise right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah, I would say three months, right? I, and that's just from from comments that you've made and others have made. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I'm saying. It's got to be a three to six month thing, and that's the thing that concerns me. And Dana, yeah. again, yeah. we're talking about people who are positive for Correct. COVID. Yeah. But those who are negative for COVID? Yeah. I, you know, I think that is a very good question, and, and, and you brought up, and, and Bruce brought it up, the delineation of have you had the disease? So that is one thing. That is a that is one risk you have to evaluate. And certainly, we know the spread of the disease is more and more. So I think if you haven't had COVID that you know of, it's probably safe. But again, we know that a lot of people are asymptomatic, so that's a whole other conversation as well. If you're pretty definitive and you know you haven't had it, it's probably safe. Now, what is your risk of getting COVID and being in those sports and being in those groups? That's one thing. But afterward, I think if you know you've had it, I think you know the smart thing, and of course the numbers that are being thrown, is maybe three to six months and waiting for that next season to start so you have time to recover. Well, and waiting for us to have a few more parts on that airplane Absolutely. so we know what we're talking. I mean, yeah. that's the other We just don't know what we don't know, and I think right. that's what's guiding our fear, and you don't want to watch people sacrifice their lives yeah. or their cognitive function, their ability to do the things they want to do down the line for a short-term gain. Other questions? Okay, Jill, maybe we let's hear what our listening audience has to say. I bet there's a few questions out there um, about this. I do have one more reporter. Matt Please. Fleener with Channel 9 texted me, and he wants to know, um, what do you see in patients that are discharged? Are you seeing the myocarditis? Are you seeing brain fog? Could you list the things that you're seeing and what their path after discharge is? You bet. That's a great mm-hmm. question. And I think, Dana, one of our challenges yeah. is, first of all, you let's say, you may have rec- you don't even have to be discharged from the hospital. Remember, this could be somebody who had COVID at home and may have been even asymptomatic mm-hmm. initially. Some of these symptoms are emerging weeks and months later. Mm-hmm. It's not that you have yeah. the German study that looked at myocarditis was testing it about 10 weeks after and still finding inflammation. So it's not what you have right when you're discharged in the, after two weeks. It's what could develop thereafter. Yeah, absolutely. We don't, you know, we don't do cardiac MRIs frequently here for, for on regular basis, especially for people who've had COVID. Um, but we do understand that just talking to the patients about their symptoms. So obviously a lot of the symptoms that are gonna be persistent afterward are gonna be malaise, which is just feeling bad, fatigue, tiredness, cough and shortness of breath certainly are uh, very important and very prevalent in a lot of patients who are discharged but also other things such as the brain fog, just not thinking correctly, maybe it's sleep disturbance. There are a lot of of symptoms. Um, I can't really, again, speak to the myocarditis in particular, just because we aren't doing that study on a regular basis for for discharge patients. But we understand in other people who have critical illness who are in the hospital, uh, we get echoes on them, echocardiograms frequently, and a lot of them do show, you know, certainly evidence at that time of acute illness, some heart dysfunction as well. Um, he also asked about rehab. How common is rehab among these patients? Yeah, we haven't really put a lot of people through yeah. rehab from that standpoint. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll turn to Tim and, and to, to Michael, but I, I don't know of a real rehab in, around COVID. Again, this stuff is it's kind of breaking news, so it's not something we really yeah. come back to. I but. think it would be more about if you have an organ that's affected. So if you actually developed myocarditis and myocardial dysfunction during yeah. your acute illness, you may end up in some sort of rehab situation, but beyond that, or if you had a heart attack as a consequence because you're elderly and had other risk factors, you may end up in a rehab situation. Yeah. But uh, as far as commonly COVID, post-COVID patients yeah. being discharged, I don't think from a heart standpoint. So Tim, we know that um, 
myocarditis or inflammation of the heart can occur with other viruses as well. What's the natural history of that and how would you treat them if it was influenza or H1N1 or, or you know, whatever? The natural history of it is for most people they recover, right? Um, and that's, you know, the average virus. Um, but we do have patients, you know, acutely, obviously, and it's the, it's the minority of them that end up coming in acutely and have, needing heart transplants or people that develop long-term sequelae where they will have uh, heart dysfunction, cardiomyopathy, um, or evidence of scar in their heart. Um, so that's, it's, it, with the average virus, I think, because we've been doing this for so long and the, this is a novel <clears throat> virus we're dealing with now, we have a good handle on that, and especially with sports, we're used to this return to play algorithm. We monitor for symptoms and all this stuff. And I think, um, you know, we're a little bit more in tune to that. But the problem is, is having asymptomatic inflammation is, yeah. is difficult a, to deal with. Difficult. Yeah, because you don't yeah. necessarily know and, it's there. And I think to your point, we don't really necessarily understand the mechanism of the myocarditis in this, the inflammation. We know that this virus does cause significant immune dysregulation. That is not like any other virus that we've seen like influenza. So. We are, you know, keeping that distinction there. Yeah, I think that's one of the key points is that this virus causes inflammation in a lot of places. Yes. It's not limited to the heart and brain. Right. It can happen in the lung. And we know that about 20% of patients with uh, this do end up with some significant lung disease yeah. and inflammation of the lung and even some scarring in the lung. So given that, that uh, w w this is just another manifestation yeah. of what we see. Mm -hmm. And we all also know that many of the people who die have had the cytokine, which is kind of an inflammatory mm -hmm. storm in their body. So store, this inflammation is a big yeah. story. And in pediatrics, we're seeing it as well. And it emerges sometimes weeks and weeks after you've had the virus yeah. and you get the inflammation. So gosh, it's just a tough story. And the problem is we just don't know what we don't know. So when people say to us, is it safe, we have to say, I don't know. And, and you know, us as, we as physicians, we hate to say I don't know because it leaves people hanging. But what we don't want to do is not tell you the truth. You see, that's where the real problem starts. Okay, so Sally wants to know if you can speak to high school sports because they don't have access to testing and monitoring capabilities. Um, are there symptoms for myocarditis? I know with brain fog, it's kind of obvious. Yeah, so that's what we were speaking of. So in, with virus, other viruses in the past, um, you would be able to identify an athlete or, or anyone with myocarditis or pericarditis, which is the inflammation of the sac around the heart, um, by them having coming in with symptoms. They would have chest pain, shortness of breath, other things, and then they would get, start to get studies and then get referred on if you're a cardiologist from sports medicine physicians. So that's the, the tough thing with COVID is, is that we're finding it in asymptomatic people and we're not sure what to do with that, right? Because we also haven't MRI'd everybody every year that gets the flu. So there's a lot of unknowns and that's why we're, when, we're, when we're being asked, do we know if it's safe, we don't know because we, we don't have a lot of information and unfortunately it's just gonna be the tincture of time to get more information and to understand better. Um, and you've kind of spoken to this, but Simone was wondering, do you ever recover from myocarditis? Yeah, there's a significant number of people that recover from myocarditis. So again, some people develop long-term heart dysfunction, but the majority of people recover um, that, that we see um, from the standpoint of that have small abnormalities. So, but most people recover from viruses in general and don't have long-term sequelae. So um, the people that develop a significant heart dysfunction from myocarditis from the average virus is not a large group. And Tim, just to say, with this one, because you're asymptomatic often when we see the myocarditis, the risk is that you could, by playing high intensity or high impact sports, get worse by doing that. Is that right? Yeah. So people that push and push and train heavily to play team or other or the other type sports um, push their adrenaline levels really high. And when you have either inflammation of your heart or a scar in your heart, that can be a nidus to have bad heart rhythms. And that's the originator of sudden death in athletes, even though it's not a high risk for the average virus, um, up to all the sudden deaths that happen across the United States in a year, it's about 8% somewhere around mm -hmm. there. So um, that's the concern with this virus. Those people we know um, more about, but we don't know with this increased documentation of the asymptomatic population, what exactly that means. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Michael, I, I don't want us to forget this neurocognitive thing because my fear is that somebody could have some mild inflammation, not have a fog, go into a high impact sports post COVID and actually give themselves a worse concussion or essentially a concussion and develop some long-term sequelae. Do you have that concern, thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I, I mean, we don't know how this is gonna affect um, uh, you know, concussions in general. Are they gonna be more susceptible? Are they going to be more susceptible to a worse injury or a longer term recovery? Um, you know, we don't know that. I, I, I sort of tell my athletes, you know, the concussion is, is based some degree on how you go into it, right? What, what you carry into it, do you carry a history of migraines or some other, you know, chronic illness? Um, those settings tend to prolong recovery from concussion. And I think if they're going in with some really subtle um, post-infectious cognitive issues and then sustain a concussion, you know, you have the chicken or the egg question, right? Which, which sort of caused it, but um, you have the risk that um, they may have a, a longer recovery. Bruce, you're a marathon athlete. Um, you've run a, a number of those. And I saw, I recall, you had a stress fracture not so long ago. It was kind I of did, a long, re how long did it take you to recover from that? Well, it took about six months, but probably because I ran a marathon in the middle of that six months. But uh, uh, it took a long time. And I think one of the points is that it does sometimes, it just takes time. That was one of my rules in the ICU uh, back when I did that a lot. Uh, the longer it takes somebody to get sick, the longer it takes them to recover. And, and like a stress fracture, it just takes a while to recover. And I think what we're really saying is we need to take our time recovering from COVID. I agree. I agree. One, one, one of the problems, though, with this is that we can have these people who are minimally symptomatic or not symptomatic at all. And we don't have the ability to say, okay, you need to stay off your activities for three months or six months. And that's what's difficult. For our professional and collegiate athletes, we have the ability to do periodic testing, but that's much, much more difficult in uh, high schools and then small colleges. Yes. And we've seen a lot of colleges, especially the small colleges, mm -hmm. cancel their sports seasons as well. And Wyandotte County or the um, uh, Wyandotte uh, uh, School District just put a halt to their fall sports seasons as well. Tina is joining us from Texas. She says, I'm an athletic trainer at a high school and we are trying to figure out the best return to play protocol. Besides the cardiac and cognitive component, what other things should we consider to return to play? Well, I'll tell you just a good history and making sure people don't have underlying lung disease. I think that's gonna be a big part of it as well. I'm just speaking as a pulmonologist. We do know that there are pulmonary changes after COVID that can sometimes persist in 10 to 20% of people. So I think a history for how short of breath, if there's any sense of shortness of breath, mm -hmm. that person needs to be evaluated by a pulmonary and a heart doc because those are those that should not be a symptom post COVID in somebody who's a high intensity athlete already. If you've got any sense of shortness of breath, trouble on the horizon to me. I would agree. I think, you know, the history and physical is still the best we can do as far as screening the average high school athlete to understand, to make sure they're not having symptoms that we feel like they're at risk and then monitoring people as much as we can. And I think every athletic trainer um, should be heightened if they have a post-COVID athlete to mm -hmm. being sensitive to make sure they're communicating with the athlete with sometimes, especially with high school and college, with teenage age people that don't necessarily always like to share everything. It's hard, but I think you have to go to that every extra step to be vigilant about talking to your athletes. Michael, there's a room for graded exercise in post-concussion. Is there any room for graded exercise return in this, do you think? And I know we're speculating entirely, so this is this is a wild leap on my part. Uh, no, absolutely, I think that I was, I was trying to raise my hand here to make sure you would call on me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we, we would absolutely use a greater return here. And, and I think what Tim said, you know, the, the perk the athletic trainers have, if you have a trainer in your school, they tend to know these athletes very well. Um, and so, you know, absolutely. You want to take a good history. You want to know how they're feeling and you put them through a graded return, um, a graded exercise program and you monitor them, um, to the point where they, don't like you very much. Um, you know, you're in their business, um, checking on them frequently. Um, and, and you just gradually, gradually increase that graded, uh, that exertion activity, um, and watch for symptoms. Um, even if you're not again, doing any formalized testing, just sort of watching for their symptoms, their reaction, again, knowing that athlete, um, and, and how they're reacting to that. You bet. Bruce, other thoughts? I think you guys have, have summarized it very well. Thank you. 
Holly wants to know, should you be getting athletes antibody testing or some other kind of testing, especially if they're asymptomatic before they return to play? So this is so that's an interesting question. Yeah. So an, should an athlete, Dana, have an yeah. antibody test, regardless if they've had a history of COVID disease, to see if they might have had it and been asymptomatic? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think a lot of that would um, depend on the infection dynamics in your community. I think it depends on testing capacity. I think antibody tests are easier to get. You know, ultimately, and I know for um, KU, we have done the antibody testing. We have. That would probably be a smart thing to do. Now, the caveat to that is being is, are we sure that the antibody testing that you're getting is accurate? So that's the other issue here. We know here with the health system, our antibody uh, testing is accurate. It's been validated by, by Rachel Leesman. We know that it's a very good antibody test. It's very sensitive and specific. So I think that is, that is one, you know, if we're talking about the optimal practice, that is certainly one of the measurements you could use to start doing to athletes to see if they have had it in the past. Just to make sure it's a screening in case it you're asymptomatic, right. because we said asymptomatic patients can have some of these other problems. Yeah. So, okay. um, Dr. Beaver, Robin wants to know, would a child who has COVID asymptomatic and also has a heart murmur be more uh, susceptible to myocarditis? So again, I'm not a pediatric cardiologist. I will put that out there, but I think it's hard to know if, whether the char, if the if the child has been proven not to have an underlying heart condition. I'm not sure that they would be at an invest risk. But if there's there's an unknown there, then they probably should see a pediatrician or a pediatric cardiologist to put it into context. Yeah, there's so much yeah. about this we don't know. And again, I turn to that wonderful picture that, that Logan and Anthony were able to bring up of us uh, huddling over the phone without masks on. You're, you know, back when this COVID we thing started. Together. Yeah, we're all close together. We look just great. <laughs> Violating every principle of infection control we now hold dear around us. Oh, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> Anthony's on, trying to mic yeah. me up, and I'm sitting there yapping. And yeah, I still look younger then. Okay, next question. Yeah, it, they're wanting to know if age matters of the athlete when it comes to myocarditis and brain fog. Yeah, I think age always I matters, but let, let, let's figure that out, let's take we, it on. We don't know, we don't have the studies, and that's the thing is we don't know what we don't know. So we don't have the information. That's the thing about COVID. I think that we're all learning a lot of this stuff in real time. And so it, it takes time to get perspective and wisdom and we just don't quite have it yet. What do you think, Michael? Um, I, I think age matters a little bit, uh, but I, I guess I would caution, I don't think um, I, I personally don't view this as, you know, kids are less susceptible. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say, I don't think kids are not susceptible um, to some of these issues. Um, could it be that uh, if you're older and sicker, you're more likely to get some of these issues? Yes. But I guess my caution would be um, not to discount age um, on the younger side as someone, well, they're healthy and, and they're not going to get the, uh, the issues that come after this. Yeah, I think we have to be really careful in the whole thing. And, and I think I would caution that youth is not a protection here because we know that the post-inflammatory syndrome in pediatrics occurs. And we know that it tends that the cytokine storm tends to be worse when you're younger. It can occur across all age groups. Yeah. But it can, so inflammation, that's a tricky deal. And we think we use these words as if they're a diagnosis, but like myocarditis and inflammation and post-concussion syndrome. But the reality is those are all syndromes. They're not an exact diagnosis, and that's part mm -hmm. of our struggle is we are using descriptive words about a process we don't totally understand. And because we don't understand it, but we're seeing it in pretty good prevalence, it's making us, as Bruce has pointed out, it's making us real nervous. You know, you know in, in, during the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, one of the reasons that maybe the young people were so susceptible is that they had such a potent immune system. And so this is one time when maybe us old guys, Steve, have an advantage. Maybe our immune systems won't to overwhelm our bodies, and maybe we, we may be better off than some of the younger folks. Give that to the bank, Bruce Toby. <laughs> <laughs> we have several pay, um, people that are asking, rank the sports. Which ones are more dangerous, indoor versus outdoor soccer? Oh, Baseball, boy, yeah. track. Okay. All right, well, from yeah. an infection control standpoint, I think we are really have landed on certainly indoor sports are definitely more dangerous, more risky for spread of the disease than outdoor sports. Um, outdoor sports, at least you are outdoor, you do have turbulent flow. Any virus that is expressed into the environment should dissipate pretty quickly. So I think certainly we've landed on 
um, you know, indoors is definitely more risky than outdoors. Yeah, and I think there are some sports, you know, I, I'm going to tell you that bowling and golf and fly fishing, some of those things aren't as endurance heavy mm -hmm. or, you know, it may not challenge as much and it may more just be like a walk. But other sports, I think they're going to be more dangerous, Tim. I'm going to let you and, and, and I want to, mm -hmm. I want our sports medicine guys. That's Steve Stites, funny looking pulmonologist answer. And let's hear what y'all think. Yeah, I think the intensities are different. You know, if you look at our guidelines, we rank sports based on their intensity of, of aerobic versus isometric activity, which is, you know, muscle strength and and ones that fall on that, football and basketball tend to be sort of very heavy and then obviously other big endurance sports, but those are the two team sports I think that are that are considered overall. So that's not in the era of COVID, that's just in general really that those yeah. are the, those are the ones that if you we worry about athletes having events, those are the, the higher risk. Long sports. distance running. Uh, I don't know necessarily long distance running, but as far as team sports do be high high intensity yeah. Football, for sure, I think, is if you look, look at the, when the, where the events stuff. occurred. Yeah. But um. Michael, thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we tend to, in the neurology world, we tend to rank them more about, um, you know, risk for impact. And so I think this is a little bit different. Uh, and I would agree with Tim. I think you're looking, in this case, more sort of for those um, either high exertion or um, more prolonged high exertion, again, football, um, uh, potentially soccer, um, those things where they're, they're running much more and, and doing more um, prolonged activity. Okay. And Bruce, what do you think? Uh, I think, again, the risk is whether it's if before you get it or after you get it. Um, I think after you get it, you'd want to be careful about doing high intensity type of sports. Time for one more question, I think. There's probably a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions. Um, I guess I'll do this one because more than one person is asking about the mask wearing and the risk of hypoxia and if athletes are wearing a mask, is it putting them at greater risk for these um, ailments that you are discussing today? Okay, well, that's interesting. So should an athlete wear a mask if they've had COVID, or will that actually put them at a higher risk for these events? And I'm just going to take the first leap at this as a lung doctor and tell you, masks really don't cause hypoxia in a healthy population. And what we see athletes doing is that when they're on the sidelines, they should wear a mask. When they're actively in the sport and they're out on the field, I don't see a lot of masks then. But what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't see a lot of masks then. I think it does, you know, if you put a mask on someone, it, it's going to be aerobically harder to perform. But there again, are you can go to um, some marathon runners that have severe allergies where you'll see them run a marathon in a mask to try to prevent the, you know, getting their, their yeah. pulmonary symptoms. So, um, I, you know, I don't think we have a great Great knowledge. Great knowledge base of that because we don't have a history of a lot of people wearing masks doing it otherwise. Mm -hmm. It definitely, I don't think it, it's going to be make someone worse, but it, um, we don't have any evidence of that that okay. I know of. I don't know of it either. either. I don't yeah. know if you guys do. Bruce, do you have any thought about that? I think it's perfectly fine to wear a mask. I think most athletes, endurance athletes, would say that it gets in their way, but uh, I don't think it would cause any harm. I don't think it's going to cause harm either. So, well, as we wrap up the program today, I want to first of all thank each of you for being here. Thank it's always me. hard to go in a place where there's a lot of unknown and to try and talk about it and to try and make people feel comfortable who are listening to our program. On the other hand, part of what we've always tried to do on this program is to be honest, to tell the truth, and let you know where it is. And then each individual has to make their own decision. How many times have you heard us say, it's a risk-benefit analysis, and each individual has to weigh the risks and their benefits. An athlete who can't play sports may have more issues around depression or, 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 um, or uh, isolation. But you have to think about it in the terms not only of what the next three months are, but really for the rest of your life. What does that really mean? So let's think about that, and let me ask our, our guests to kind of give us our, their final comments today. Bruce, let's start with you. Well, I think that these are unsettled times. I would recommend that everybody take stock of what's important, be careful, do the right thing. Final thoughts. Yeah, I would, uh, I think I would echo Dr. Toby's response and just say, you know, a, a cautious approach is not um, a bad approach and, and that thinking through all of your options and making an educated decision with um, as much knowledge as you absolutely can is, is probably the important piece here. I think the only thing I would have to add to that is young people are very resilient. And I think, you know, that although this has been a tough time for them, I think that they're going to they're gonna be resilient and do great. 
Yeah, and are your kids playing fall sports or football this fall? Yeah, my son has decided after you know the shared decision making mm -hmm. discussion with me and my wife that that he's not going to play football this fall. So yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. Dana. You know, these are tough decisions. Um, as we get more and more information and knowledge about this, we'll certainly relay that to you. We always come from the standpoint of the most up-to-date medical information and what we have, and we've seen this evolve um, from the first days we were doing this, and we'll continue to give you, again, the most accurate, up-to-date information. Yeah, we didn't like huddling around that phone. We wouldn't do that now, would we? Uh, we learned a little bit. And isn't that the, really the story? Mm -hmm. The story is that the more we get learn, the more we know. Sometimes the more we learn, the more we don't know. And that's what's happening right now. We've learned some things over the last few weeks about a high incidence of myocarditis and neurocognitive dysfunction after COVID-19. We knew it was out there beforehand. We may not have realized its reach. That has implications for all of us. It has implications for our children, for our parents, for ourselves. Sometimes, as we've said, you got to know what you don't know, and then you just have to do the right thing, the next right thing. And that's something that each person has to help define on their own. Our job is to stay in our medical lane. We're not going to tell you what to do, but we're going to tell you this is the information you have and try to make the best possible decision, the most informed decision that you can. And the one that we keep coming back to is, can we tell you that it's safe? Those young people who wanted to become respiratory therapies with CF, respiratory therapists with CF, I could tell them, you know, I don't think it's safe. I had one still try, I had to stop later. But what you do try to find when you say to somebody, I don't think you should do that, is you try to find hope. And I think the hope here is there are emerging therapies, there are new things, there are all sorts of things coming out. And as it is right now, we don't think this is a permanent state. We don't think this is going to be long term. We believe you are going to recover. The human body is a magnificent thing, and it has amazing recuperative powers. Sometimes you just have to give it enough chance that you've been fully recovered. You can totally come back. And sometimes that just takes time. Hey, tomorrow, Roy Jensen, Greg Gann, and Deepika Polanini are here to talk about a new COVID 19 study that we're launching using an old cancer drug that may have important powers for defeating COVID-19. You might want to join us. I think that'll be fun, too. And we normally answer questions Friday, but actually we did the sports thing today, which pushed that conversation into tomorrow. And we wanted to make sure we had that sports conversation because so much of that is going on out there. Got a couple of cool, mask or a couple of cool uh, masking pictures again. High school baseball coach, I'm not going to say this right, Martiz. Hope that I got that close. Gardner shows off his University Academy mask and his first real estate commission check accomplished during a pandemic. He shows us how to be out and about safely. Thank you, sir. And the Turner family says, two girls and two boys can be a handful, but they love shopping with their masks. Great job on the role modeling. Hey, we're back here tomorrow. We hope you're with us. And remember, there's still no place like home. Let's all stay safe.